paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. In 2005, the Palm Beach Police Department had a complaint about Jeffrey Epstein. It was from the parents of a 14-year-old girl. The Palm Beach police officers talked to the girl, talked to her parents, and the girl described Jeffrey Epstein's home, and she also described his anatomy. So the Palm Beach Police Department decided to investigate at that point, and they found four other underage victims of uh, Jeffrey Epstein, and there was a number of corroborating statements from other people regarding those five underage girls. So the Palm Beach Police Department was charging Jeffrey Epstein with unlawful sexual activity with four minors, one count of lewd and lascivious molestation. They felt like they had an airtight case and they were ready to uh, charge him. And all of a sudden that investigation was taken away from them. It was assigned to a grand jury. A lot of people are somewhat naive about grand juries. A New York judge once quipped that special prosecutors of a grand jury have so much power over grand jurors that they could get them to indict a ham sandwich. In Florida, to have a grand jury for anything other than a capital offense is unheard of. So this grand jury was impaneled and they came back with, in fact, a ham sandwich. This is from the Palm Beach uh, Post. July 27, 2007, an indictment charging Epstein 53 was unsealed on Monday, charging him with one count of felony adult solicitation of prostitution. So this grand jury did not charge Jeffrey Epstein with a single account of child abuse, or it indicted him on one count of adult solicitation. And the Palm Beach Police Department, they knew that Jeffrey Epstein was guilty and they became quite vociferous. Michael Ryder, ultimately, the Palm Beach Police Chief, ultimately went to uh, the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice announced the impaneling of a federal grand jury to investigate Epstein. And then the grand jury was suddenly adjourned. And at this point, the Department of Justice then started clandestine negotiations with Epstein and his dream team of attorneys, which included. Alan Dershowitz and Ken Starr. While the Department of Justice was involved in these negotiations, they had a list of 32 victims of Jeffrey Epstein. So these negotiations ultimately resulted in the sweetheart deal that he received in 2008, which was 18 months in county jail. And then he served uh, 13 months and he just had to go there at night. And here's a clandestine email between the assistant U.S. attorney prosecuting Jeffrey Epstein and the Epstein attorney, Jay Lefkowitz. Their negotiations were so sordid and so beyond the pale that they knew that they had to find a special magistrate or judge to sign off on it. And this is Emery Villafana, the assistant U.S. attorney. And she says, our most flexible Palm Beach magistrate is on duty on Monday. So assuming we have signed documents by 1.30 or so, we should be able to get Mr. Epstein arraigned on Monday. The Department of Justice and Jeffrey Epstein's uh, attorneys are colluding on this. And the deal that they gave Jeffrey Epstein was so atrocious that they had to find a special magistrate to sign off on. And then the agreement with Jeffrey Epstein and the Department of Justice was sealed, um, kind of adding insult to injury. And attorneys launching civil suits in the Palm Beach Post appealed the sealing of Epstein's agreement. Ultimately, the government's sealing of the agreement was overturned in the Fourth U.S. District Court of Appeals. So what did the agreement say? This is... Uh, Epstein's non-prosecution agreement, and it exonerates everyone who was part of Jeffrey Epstein's pedophilic network. It's, it's, it's quite a stunning document. In consideration of Epstein's agreement to plead guilty and to provide compensation in the manner described above, 
If Epstein successfully fulfills all the terms and conditions of this agreement, the United States also agrees that it will not institute any criminal charges against any potential conspirators of Epstein, including but not limited to Sarah Kellen, Adriana Ross, Leslie Groff, and uh, Nadia Marcinkova. So basically, that's why they needed that, that magistrate is because this is such a horrific deal. And actually, most lawyers uh, that I've talked to have never heard of a deal like this. Epstein was allowed to molest and traffic children for another 10 years. And this is an article from the Daily Beast on July 6, 2019. Epstein is, in fact, arrested for child trafficking. He was arrested in New Jersey at the Teterboro Airport, and the, uh, the indictment came from the Department of Justice in Manhattan. And this is from a New York Times article on 8-10-2019. Epstein apparently kills himself. So all those questions that, that were going to be asked about Jeffrey Epstein and his network seemingly died uh, when he killed himself. But attorney William Barr, he vowed that Epstein's co-conspirators should not rest easy. This is from Reuters on August 12th, 2019. William Barr, our illustrious attorney general, was gonna get to the bottom of it. And he was gonna make sure that the perpetrators and the procurers not rest easily. And then about two weeks later, the New York Times has an article and they name Six procurers of Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, Sarah Kellen, Leslie Groff, Adriana Ross, Nadia Marcinkova, and Haley Robson. The New York Times basically puts a number of uh, procurers in an article and, and shows how they, uh, they broke the law for Jeffrey Epstein. And it's quite remarkable. The Department of Justice did not act uh, after that article came out. Here's an article from Reuters in December the Justice Department is mums the word on Maxwell in September, October, November. Inexplicably, the probe remains at an early stage at the end of December. So Epstein has killed himself, and months later, even after the New York Times has named a bunch of procurers, the probe remains at an early stage. According to the Miami Herald, Virginia Gufri settled a 2017 defamation lawsuit against Maxwell and received millions of dollars. And in that uh, lawsuit, Virginia actually talked about Maxwell being a procurer, a perp, and also a trafficker. And by the end of January, three additional women accused Maxwell of being a perpetrator in lawsuits. This is from the New York Times. In March, investigators are trying to determine who may have assisted him, Epstein, in recruiting young girls and women to be sexually abused and who may have moved money to further these efforts. Months down the line, after these civil suits and also an uh, article by the New York Times in naming the procurers, the Department of Justice is still trying to determine who could have been a cohort of Epstein's, even though there's been a tremendous amount of evidence that would tell them who is a cohort of Epstein. The New York Post reported in, in uh, July 2nd, 2020, that Ghislaine Maxwell actually had been indicted. She was indicted on one count of conspiracy to entice minors to travel to engage in illegal acts, one count of enticement of a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, one count of conspiracy to transport minors with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, one count of transportation of a minor with intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, and two counts of perjury. Maxwell is looking at a maximum of 35 years. With Maxwell looking at 35 years, that in and of itself is a travesty of justice. A number of Maxwell's victims have come forward and said that uh, sh she was in fact a trafficker um, of underage girls. And trafficking uh, of minors carries a sentence of between 15 years and, and life. Ghislaine Maxwell should have been hammered with multiple indictments of child trafficking, and she should be looking at multiple years in prison. And the other procurers, they should also be hammered with multiple counts of child trafficking, and they should be also looking at uh, many, many years in prison.
Maxwell's original indictments were superseded by one count of child trafficking, which carries a 15-year-to-life sentence. Now we're going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the butler and the black book. Former Epstein house manager Alfredo Rodriguez attempted to peddle Epstein's black book to an attorney launching civil suits. And the attorney went to the FBI, and Rodriguez was ensnared in an FBI sting. Now, according to the affidavit of an FBI agent, the black book contains the names and contact information of material witnesses and additional victims. And Rodriguez circled the names of potential material witnesses and victims. And a material witness is someone who, whose testimony can be the critical mass of proving someone uh, broke the law. Here are the Florida victims that were circled by Rodriguez. As you can see, there's a lot of victims in Florida. And Jeffrey Epstein went through a lot of uh, underage girls over the years. Here's potential material witnesses circled by Rodriguez and also named by Virginia Gufri as perpetrators. And Virginia has passed a lie detector test. Rodriguez circled Glenn Maxwell as a uh, perpetrator. And Virginia Gufri named Glenn Maxwell as a perpetrator. Rodriguez circled Alan Dershowitz as a perpetrator, and Virginia Gufri has named Alan Dershowitz as a procurer. Bill Richardson's name was also circled by Rodriguez. Uh, Richardson is the former governor of New Mexico, and he was also the energy czar under Clinton. And Virginia Gufri has said that uh, Bill Richardson had molested her. And Jean Luc Brunel is also circled, and Virginia Gufri has said that uh, she was molested by John Luke Brunel. Here's some additional potential material witnesses circled by Rodriguez and also named by Virginia Gufri as perpetrators. The billionaire Lex Wessner, his name was circled by um, Rodriguez and Gufri has named him as a perpetrator. The former prime minister of Israel was circled by Rodriguez as a perpetrator and Ehud Barak and Ahud Barak was also named by Virginia Gufri as a perpetrator. Now, here's some uncircled names in the Black Book named by Virginia as perpetrators. Duke of York, Prince Andrew, the scientist Marvin Minsky, the billionaire Glenn Dubin, and former Democratic Senator uh, George Mitchell, who was actually the majority leader of the Senate at one point. And with this slide, uh, Epstein had 21 contact numbers for Bill Clinton in the Black Book, and Donald Trump's name is circled. Gufri has not named Clinton or Donald Trump as perpetrators, but she did say that she saw two minors accompanying Bill Clinton on Epstein's uh, island. We're gonna switch gears again, and we're gonna look at the blackmail enterprise of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. So when the Palm Beach Police Department originally executed its search warrant on May 1st, 2006, they came across covert cameras hidden within clocks in Jeffrey Epstein's Palm Beach home. November 18th, 2019, CBS This Morning interviewed Maria Farmer, and this is an excerpt from Maria's uh, interview. The main thing he did when I walked in and I thought was interesting, he showed me where the cameras, the men monitoring everything were. And I looked on the cameras and I saw toilet, toilet, bed, bed, toilet, bed. So what Maria Farmer is saying here is that multiple rooms in Jeffrey Epstein's New York mansion have been wired for blackmail. And that men, as in plural, are looking at the monitors. So Jeffrey Epstein has men that are plural helping him in his blackmail enterprise. This is a Vanity Fair article from August 12th, 2019. And the, the Vanity Fair article talked to a former girlfriend of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And according to her, Epstein said, I collect people, I own people, I can damage people. And in furtherance of showing that Jeffrey Epstein was in fact a blackmail artist, uh, this is uh, a friend of Maxwell's talking about Maxwell. Maxwell also said the island had been completely wired for video. The friend thought that she and Epstein were videotaping everyone on the island as an insurance policy, as blackmail. And this is another quote from uh, Ghislaine Maxwell that has nothing to do with blackmail, but it has everything to do with uh, how these monsters looked upon underage girls. 
When I asked what she thought of the underage girls, she looked at me and said, they're nothing, these girls, they are trash. They're nothing, these girls, they are trash. So she looks upon these girls as, as trash and uh, she treats them as trash and, and she traffics them as trash. This is from the New York Times. A journalist had become acquaintances with, with Jeffrey Epstein. And of course, this was off the record. And then once Epstein died, the journalist uh, wrote an article about his interactions with Jeffrey Epstein. And in it, he said, Mr. Epstein knew an astonishing number of rich, famous, and powerful people and had photos to prove it. He also claimed to know a great deal about these people, some of it potentially damaging or embarrassing, including details about their supposed sexual proclivities and recreational drug use. So Jeffrey Epstein, his arrogance is coming out at this point, and he's even telling a journalist off the record that he's a Mount Black man. And this is from another New York Times article. Federal authorities seized hundreds, possibly thousands, of sexually suggestive photographs of girls who appear underage, as well as hand-labeled compact discs with titles like Girls, Pics, Nude, and with the names redacted, and Young, Name Redacted, plus name redacted. So these DVDs possibly contain blackmail footage of Jeffrey Epstein, given what this article is saying. And they certainly have a lot of images of uh, child pornography, but yet we haven't heard anything about that investigation and don't know whether any of these girls that were on these pornographic films were, were approached by law enforcement. This is an article from the Evening Standard. This article was published on January 22nd, 2001. This is way before Jeffrey Epstein became infamous. And this is a quote from the article. He has a license to carry a concealed weapon, once claimed to have worked for the CIA, although now he denies it. And this is another excerpt from the article. He has the spook connections and pulls the strings worldwide. This author is definitely thinks that Jeffrey Epstein is. Uh, is working for intelligence. And then another excerpt from the article, Epstein has joined Andrew and Ghislaine Maxwell on five of their breaks together in the past 12 months, to Mar-a-Lago, Phuket, Florida, and Windsor, and has also welcomed Prince Andrew to stay at his $30 million New York townhouse at least twice last year. Randy Andy has distanced himself from Jeffrey Epstein, but there's just, they, they had so much contact. They obviously had a friendship. Prince Andrew can run, but he can't hide. So this is from the Daily Beast on July 7, 2019. Alexander Acosta was the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida that ultimately signed off on Jeffrey Epstein's uh, sweetheart deal in 2008, where he spent 13 months in a county jail. He was charged with one count of molestation, but the Department of Justice knew of 32 victims. And Alexander Acosta was actually, after he served as U.S. attorney and participated in covering up Jeffrey Epstein's uh, enterprise and gave him, you know, signed off on the non-prosecution agreement, he was bumped up to... Uh, to be Donald Trump's labor secretary. And actually he became Donald Trump's labor secretary after this egregious, egregious cover up. This is kind of interesting. When Acosta was transitioning to labor secretary, he was asked about the sweetheart deal that he gave Epstein. And he reportedly responded, he had been told to back off that Epstein was above his pay grade. I was told Epstein belonged to intelligence and to leave it alone. So yet we have another example of uh, Jeffrey Epstein belonging possibly to a, a, an intelligence organization. So Jeffrey Epstein protected pedophile and blackmail artists. Jeffrey Epstein purportedly molested Annie Farmer in 1996. The Farmer sisters reported Epstein to the FBI in 1996 and were stonewalled. And Jeffrey Epstein actually came to the federal authorities in 1996 and they just ignored the Farmer sisters. Had they not ignored the Farmer sisters, Think of the scores of women now who were victims then who wouldn't have been molested by Jeffrey Epstein. Over the course of 30 years, Jeffrey Epstein, I believe, trafficked uh, underage girls for about 30 years. Uh, he and his cohorts molested scores and scores of underage girls, some reportedly as young as 11 or 12 with impunity. 
the mainstream media sticks with 14 year olds, but there's been examples of girls that were molested at 13. Actually, one of the lawsuits that's been settled, the girl was, uh, had been uh, 13 years old when Jeffrey Epstein molested her. And there's a couple of articles that I'm aware of that said that the youngest victim was uh, 11 or 12 years old. The Justice Department had a list of 32 Epstein victims, which could have guaranteed Epstein a life sentence. But according to Alexander Acosta, intelligence intervened, and Epstein was given a sweetheart deal culminating in 13 months in county jail. Alexander Acosta was told to lay off Jeffrey Epstein, that he belonged to intelligence. And what's really interesting here is people that were behind Jeffrey Epstein were able to engineer his sweetheart deal in 2008. That same shadowy network was able to allow Jeffrey Epstein to essentially traffic young women for almost 25 years after the Farmer sisters went to the FBI. Epstein could not have blackmailed power brokers with impunity because such men typically have access to ruffians, murderers, and even organized crime. The only way Epstein could have blackmailed some of the most powerful men in the world and lived to tell the tale was if those power brokers were aware that Epstein had the backing of a very powerful network or organization that would protect him and seek retribution. And this is an important point. Jeffrey Epstein by himself could not have blackmailed some of the most powerful men in the world. There had to be an organization behind him that said to these people who are blackmailed, these men that were blackmailed, don't uh, even think about trying to hurt Jeffrey Epstein or we'll take you down. And I'll give you an example of someone who is unbelievably generous to Jeffrey Epstein, who also has uh, ties to uh, organized crime. So Les Wexner, a black male mark. Les Wexner is the CEO of L Brands, which includes Victoria's Secret, Pink, Bath and Body Works, CEO Bigelow, Abercrombie and Finch. And he has a net worth of $4.5 billion. Now, this is an article from the New York Times on July 27, 2019 is that Epstein was introduced to Wexner in the mid to late 1980s. And Mr. Epstein started spending more and more time around Wexner, leaving longtime colleagues puzzled about why he was embracing this newcomer. So the people around Les Wexner were perplexed. Why is Les Wexner embracing Jeffrey Epstein like this? Now, the clearest sign of Mr. Wexner's nearly limitless comfort with Mr. Epstein came in July 1991. Mr. Wexner signed a three-page legal document known as Power of Attorney that enabled Mr. Epstein to hire people, sign checks, buy and sell properties, and borrow money. So Les Wexner has not known Jeffrey Epstein for that long, and he hands the keys to his empire to Jeffrey Epstein in 1991. Jeffrey Epstein can do whatever he wants with Les Wexner's money. There's two articles about the New York Times that I've taken this information from. On July 6, 2020, Wexner wrote a letter to L. Brand employees vowing that he was never aware of the illegal activity charged in Epstein's latest indictment. After Palm Beach police arrested Epstein for multiple counts of child abuse in 2006, Wexner ostensibly severed his connections 18 months after the fact. But despite their purported rupture in 2007, one of Wexner's charitable foundations received a $56 million infusion from a trust linked to Epstein in 2011. Wexner also claims that he discovered that Epstein had embezzled vast sums of money from him in 2007, but he never notified authorities. So Wexner is saying that basically Jeffrey Epstein trampled all over him. And their financial relationship uh, went along, was definitely active uh, after Jeffrey Epstein had his sweetheart deal in 2008. And Les Wexner is also saying that Jeffrey Epstein ripped him off. We're going to look at Les Wexner's ties to uh, organized crime. Arthur Shapiro was the partner of an esteemed law firm, Schwartz, Shapiro, Kelman, Warren, which represented the limited, the retail empire of business potentate. Les Wexner. And this is an excerpt from the article. Someone wanted to silence Columbus lawyer Arthur L. Shapiro. Two billets were fired point blank into his head as he pounded on the door of a 
Northwest Side condo on the morning of March 6, 1985. 25 years later, the slain remains unsolved. So this is a high-flying attorney, and, the, and he's a partner in a law firm that does a lot of business with, with Les Wexner. Shapiro was the law firm's point man for dealing with uh, Lex Wexner and, and L Brands. Now here's a 1990 report on the Shapiro homicide. It's from the Columbus Police Department. And it's very, very telling. This report was so explosive on the death of Columbus attorney Arthur L. Shapiro that the police chief ordered it to be destroyed. And obviously it wasn't destroyed because I have a copy of it. But here's this explosive homicide report from 1991, six years after uh, Shapiro's death, that the police chief orders to be destroyed. So what, what is so explosive in this? Uh, there's some excerpts from it. From the predicate facts presented, it appears that Lex Wessner had established contact with associates reputed to be organized crime figures, one of whom was a major investment partner and another was using the limited headquarters as a mailing address. Francis J. Walsh, or Frank, is the owner and chief executive officer of Walsh Trucking Company out of New Jersey. Walsh Trucking is, has been a primary transporter for the Limited in Columbus. In July 1984, Walsh was being investigated by the New York Organized Crime Task Force. Notices to this effect were addressed to Walsh at one Limited Parkway, Wexner's uh, headquarters. Thus, the concluding hypothesis is that Arthur Shapiro could have answered too many of these sorts of questions and might have been forced to answer them in his impending grand jury hearing. This uh, report goes on to implicate Les Wexner and Shapiro's homicide. Here's a Women's Wear Daily from June 25th, 1987. These are a couple of excerpts. Walsh had, had done in excess of 90% of the Limited's business. Court papers show that Walsh's revenues from the Limited totaled $73 million, 600,000 in 1985. So Francis J. Walsh and Les Wexner were obviously very well acquainted with each other because in one year, Les Wexner gave Walsh over $73 million. Now here's an article from the Bergen Record talking about uh, Walsh's connections to the organized crime. It's from uh, June 9th, 1996. Walsh, described as an associate of the Genovese crime family by federal investigators, also pleaded guilty to two counts of mail fraud for falsifying loan applications that netted him $3 million in bank loans. I've shown that Limited used Walsh's services very prolifically and that uh, Walsh was, in fact, an organized crime figure. The government cover-up thus far, four presidential administrations, Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden have stood down from prosecuting the numerous procurers and perpetrators in the Jeffrey Epstein network. Not one of our 535 federal legislators have called for an investigation into Jeffrey Epstein's trafficking network of procurers and perpetrators. And the mainstream media has been complicit in the government cover-up. The Epstein cover-up's final act, the cleanup crew, Attorney Jordana Feldman was the administrator of the Epstein Victims Compensation Program. Feldman had previously administered the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. David Boys, whose law firm, Boys Schiller Flexner, represented a number of the Epstein victims, helped craft the parameters of the Epstein Victims Compensation Program. David Boys became a darling of the left when he represented Al Gore before the Supreme Court in Gore's ill-fated attempt to dispute the 2000 election that awarded the presidency to George Bush. However, Boyce is fond of using Black Cube, a firm of retired Mossad agents who specialize in dirty deeds. In November of 2017, the New York Times announced that it had severed its ties with Boyce because he deployed Black Cube to spy on its reporters and prevent the publication of a damaging story about his client, Harvey Weinstein. And at this time, Boys was also defending the New York Times in a libel lawsuit. Can you say conflict of interest? Boys also deployed Black Cube on Rose McGowan, who was in the first wave of actresses who accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault. 
Boys deployed Black Cube yet again to quash derogatory information that was leaking out about grifter Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And actually, David Board was on the board of Theranos. This is from a New York Times article on November 9th, 2017. It's an op-ed written by a legal scholar, Deborah Rode, and the title of it is David Boyd's Egregious Involvement with Harvey Weinstein. One of the nation's most respected lawyers, David Boyd, is among those whose work helped Mr. Weinstein try to conceal his abusive behavior. Mr. Boyd personally signed a contract with a private investigation organization, Black Cube, to unearth, as the contract specified, quote, intelligence, which will help the client's efforts to completely stop the publication of a new negative article in a leading New York newspaper. Deborah Rode will go on to write that already less than a fifth of Americans rate the honesty and integrity of lawyers as high or very high. The sort of conduct here is the reason why. And I have a tendency to disagree with, uh, with Deborah Rode about a fifth of Americans. I think it's 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad rap. Now we come to Stan Pottinger. He is the Forrest Gump of cover-ups. If you need a cover-up, Stan is the man. Stan Pottinger had ostensibly retired from a career of government cover-ups and dirty deeds, and he was writing novels when David Boyes apparently tapped him to help Boyes Schiller Flexner represent more than 20 Epstein victims. Let's go over Stan's past a little bit. Assistant, he became an assistant attorney general for civil rights in 1973. His first major cover-up involved National Guard soldiers murdering four students at Kent State University in Ohio in 1970. The National Guard soldiers were acquitted of murder and distraught families and friends and also concerned citizens implored the Justice Department to reinvestigate the case. And this is Stan Pottinger. Until you exhaust your ability to ask questions, you have really not done your job, Pottinger said before impaneling a grand jury. In the uh, upper left-hand corner, next to John Stanley Pottinger, we have civil rights protector. So that's uh, keep that in mind, that he's a civil rights protector. That's very rich. So this is from the New York Times from March 30th, 1974. A grand jury indicted eight of the soldiers for violating the civil rights of the students who were shot. I, I guess murdering someone I would be canceling out their civil rights. Um, but one would think that that's going a little light. OK, so the soldiers faced one year of imprisonment and or a thousand dollar fine. I think that that's going kind of light, too, for murder. The grand jury ruled that the soldiers had acted impromptly without orders from a superior officer. So the massacre did not entail a conspiracy. And ultimately, a judge acquitted the soldiers of civil rights violations. This is from an article from the New York Times on May 2nd, 2007. In 2007, a tape of the massacre surfaced. A voice is heard on the tape shouting, Get set! point fire. The Justice Department had a copy of that tape during the grand jury that Pottinger impaneled, and it contracted an acoustics firm in Massachusetts to analyze it. The firm said no National Guard voices were audible on the tape. COINTELPRO, which is counterintelligence program, was exposed by the Senate's church hearings in 1976. Here's an excerpt from the final report of the church hearings on COINTELPRO. The government, operating primarily through secret informants, but also using intrusive techniques such as wiretaps, microphone bugs, surreptitious mail opening, and break-ins, has swept in vast amounts of information about the personal lives, views, and associations of American citizens. Groups and individuals have been harassed and disrupted because of their political views and their lifestyles. Investigations have been based upon vague standards whose breath made excessive collection inevitable. Unsavory and vicious tactics have been employed 
including anonymous attempts to break up marriage, disrupt meetings, ostracize persons from their professions, and provoke target groups into rivalries that might result in deaths. Unsavory and vicious tactics. Legal harassment, intimidation, wiretapping, infiltration, smear campaigns, and blackmail in the suborning of perjury that resulted in countless prison sentences, and in the case of Black Panther, Fred Hampton, and others, murder. A famous example of COINTELPRO tactics occurred when FBI agents called Coretta Scott King to inform her of her husband's infidelity. An anonymous letter thought to be written by Assistant FBI Director William Sullivan was sent to Martin Luther King, threatening to expose his marital infidelity unless he committed suicide before he accepted the Nobel Prize. I guess that would fall under unsavory and vicious. Assistant Attorney General Stan Pottinger investigates COINTELPRO. The church hearings gleaned 20,000 pages of FBI documents, took depositions from numerous FBI agents, and interviewed several COINTELPRO targets. A December 13, 1974 memorandum from Pottinger to Attorney General William Saxby discussed the investigation Pottinger oversaw. And he concluded the Civil Rights Division found, quote, no basis for making criminal charges against particular individuals or involving particular incidents, unquote. Although some of the acts reviewed appeared to amount to technical violations, the division concluded that, quote unquote, without more information, prosecutive action would not be justified under its normal criteria. I guess, apparently, illegal wiretapping and blackmail, just to name a few things, don't count as crimes to the great civil rights protector. And it's interesting that he didn't have enough information, considering that the church hearings gleaned 20,000 pages of FBI documents, took depositions from numerous FBI agents, and interviewed several COINTELPRO targets. Well, Stan was assistant attorney general, and COINTEL was in its uh, heyday. The FBI waged a war against the American Indian movement. The Black Panthers in the American Indian Movement were major targets of COINTELPRO. In a 2019 documentary that aired on PBS, From Wounded Knee to Standing Rock, A Reporter's Journey, Tom Parker, a retired FBI agent who worked for COINTELPRO, confessed that the FBI had helped to fracture and disrupt the American Indian Movement. We wanted them to kill each other as we were in a war against AIM, Parker said. According to Parker, a main goal of COINTELPRO was to infiltrate informers into AIM and to publicly identify AIM activists with the FBI so that others in AIM would turn against them. And one of the tragic victims of COINTELPRO was Anne May Aquash. She was a Mi'kmaq Indian and also a member of AIM. Two members of AIM murdered her in December of 1975 after the FBI had disseminated rumors that she was a government informant. AIM reacts in part to the dissension sown by COINTELPRO and occupies Wounded Knee, South Dakota, the site of the 1890 Native American massacre. A 420 1973 New York Times article reports J. Stanley Pottinger, the government's chief negotiator at the scene, said late today the insurgents holding the village had reportedly received rifle firing from the prairies, and we conclude the shots were fired by ousted residents of the historic Indian village. It's a very dangerous situation, said Pottinger. Two Native Americans died during the Malay, and a third went missing. Appeasing the Sioux elders, the American Indian Movement relinquished the village. But 185 Native Americans were subsequently indicted by federal grand juries on charges associated with the occupation. The Justice Department pursued Dennis Banks and Russell Means, the leaders of the occupation, with a vengeance, indicted them on multiple counts that included conspiracy, arson, theft, assault, illegal possession of firearms, and interfering with federal officers. Hottinger and the Justice Department planned to imprison banks and means for decades. 
but the truth can often be inconvenient. The trial judge discovered that the FBI had altered or suppressed key documents, committed illegal electronic surveillance, and had probably persuaded law enforcement officials in River Falls, Wisconsin, to drop rape and sodomy charges against the government's star witness. The judge also stated that the special agent in charge of the Minnesota division of the FBI, which covers three states, including South Dakota, had perjured himself on the witness stand. He dismissed all the charges against banks and means. This is a March 24th, 1976 New York Times article that reported Pottinger oversaw, quote, a review of files, unquote, related to Martin Luther King's murder in 1968. Even though Pottinger is listed as general counsel for a San Francisco law firm at the time. The 1968 inquiry ruled out a conspiracy and include, concluded James Earl Ray was the lone assassin. But the church hearings disclosed the scope of the FBI's harassment and antipathy towards Martin Luther King, which sparked a public outcry. In the wake of the church hearings revelations about MLK and the FBI, the Department of Justice announced a second inquiry into the assassination of Martin Luther King. And we have nothing to worry about because Stan Pottinger oversaw the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department's examination of the FBI's 96-volume archive that it had compiled on Martin Luther King. Pottinger in the Civil Rights Division concluded that James Earl Ray was the lone assassin. It's very interesting. A number of years after Pottinger's conclusion, the King family brought a civil suit against people whom they thought had been perpetrators in Martin Luther King's assassination. It's interesting to note that James Earl Ray pleaded guilty shortly after his apprehension to avoid the death penalty, but shortly thereafter, he attempted to recant his confession. The King family did not believe that Ray was guilty of assassinating Martin Luther King and felt he had been murdered because he started to speak out against the Vietnam War. The King family initiated a civil case against various conspirators, including the FBI and CIA. Lloyd Jowers, a former Memphis Tavern owner, and Donald Wilson, a former FBI agent, were the primary witnesses for the plaintiffs. And as I said, this jury ruled that there were a number of people that were involved in the Martin Luther King assassination and that James Earl Ray was not involved. Here's an article from the New York Times from February 20th, 1976. CIA Director Richard Helms ordered the break-in into a photography studio that was owned by a former CIA employee. Pottinger oversaw the case and determined that Helms was innocent of civil rights violations. I had lead responsibility in this case for a couple of months, said Pottinger. We have spared no resources, no time, and no effort. Apparently, the CIA can break into the business of an American citizen, and that doesn't contravene their civil rights. And here's an excerpt from the article. However, Mr. Pottinger told a news conference that Helms' congressional testimony is under review for possible charges. Helms told a number of lies before Congress when he testified that the CIA didn't conduct domestic surveillance. And we know that Stan Pottinger is going to exact justice. And Helms did, in fact, lie to the Senate. Helms testified to Congress that the CIA had not followed money to opponents of Chilean President Salvador Allende. But the church hearings discovered that the CIA had funneled $8 million to foes of Allende. Helms testified to Congress that the CIA had not conducted domestic surveillance. However, the church hearings found that nearly a quarter of a million first-class letters were opened and photographed in the United States by the CIA. The CIA's Operation Chaos indexed 300,000 individuals in a CIA computer system and created files on 7,200 Americans and over 100 domestic groups. Intelligence files on more than 11,000 individuals and groups were created by the Internal Revenue Service. So obviously, 
the CIA has been up to no good as far as spying domestically. Richard Helms told a lot of lies before Congress. And we know that Pottinger is going to help seek justice on behalf of Americans. So here's a New York Times article from November 1st, 1977, about Richard Helms. Helms pleaded no contest to two misdemeanors. He was fined $2,000 and given a two-year suspended sentence. Apparently, Operation Chaos didn't violate American civil rights, or Pottinger would have surely brought down the hammer on Helms. This is a New York Times article from July 19th, 1984. Stan Ponger is no longer part of the Department of Justice. Now he's part of criminal enterprises. And the article is, states, Mr. Pottinger, a former head of the Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department, was mentioned twice in the indictment. And what was the indictment? Ponger was the attorney for the Iranian Hashimi brothers who were illegally sending arms to Iran during the hostage crisis. This is when the Ayatollah Khomeini had the revolution and the Shah was deposed and the Ayatollah became the number one man. So Hanjur is caught on tape instructing the Hashimis how to ship the arms without disclosing, quote, the identity of the parties involved and the true destination of the goods. So he's obviously involved in shipping arms to an enemy. In the very least, that would be treason. I mean, plus a number of other things. And that paragon of integrity, Rudolph Giuliani, he was the U.S. attorney involved in the investigation. And he said, the investigation of Mr. Pottinger is still continuing. It would be unfair to make a judgment at this point. But we know that Rudolph Giuliani is going to come down on Stan Pottinger for these arms deals that are obviously treasonous. Here's an article from the Washington Post on July 19th, 1984. According to a high-level federal official who asked not to be identified, Pottinger was to be indicted last month, but several tape recordings of Pottinger's meetings with the Hashemis have been misplaced. Couldn't they get Stan off on a technicality? Our Department of Justice had to say that they lost the evidence that would have indicted Stan. And here's another quote from the article. The FBI reportedly has partial transcripts of the tapes, but Pottinger's attorneys argue they are insufficient evidence. And in fact, they were insufficient evidence because Stan was not indicted. The October surprise. Prior to the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, Individuals who'd become part of his administration met with Iranian officials in Madrid and Paris. The Reagan emissaries told the Iranians that if they held the 52 American hostages until after the election of Reagan, the Reagan administration would give the Iranians a blue light special on armaments to wage a war against the Iraqis, who were also selling weapons to Reagan won by a landslide, and the day he took office, the Iranians released the American hostages. The October Surprise and Stan Pottinger. In December of 1992, the House of Representatives formed a task force to probe the October Surprise. The former president of Iran, Abdul Hassan Bani Sadr, wrote a letter to Congress dated December 17, 1992, which corroborated the October surprise. In the letter, Bonnie Sauter wrote that a July 1980 meeting in Madrid, attended by a nephew of Ayatollah Khomeini, Iranian financier Cyrus Hashemi, and Pottinger commenced the early negotiations of the October surprise. The House and Senate's investigation of the October surprise. Ponger's name is mentioned 174 times in the House's investigation. However, the Reagan officials and operatives, including Ponger, who participated in the October surprise, denied their participation. Hard to believe that these guys would lie about something like that. The House and Senate concluded that the arms dealers, spies, and Iranians who attested to the October surprise were not credible. 
Ergo, there was no October surprise. This is from a New York Times article from March 19th of this year. 43-year secret of sabotage. Mission to subvert Carter is revealed. So finally, the New York Times reports on the October surprise. There has been a tremendous amount of evidence about the October surprise. It was just a given for people that I talked to about parapolitics. And this is the New York Times take on it. Ben Barnes, the youngest speaker of the Texas House of Representatives and former Lieutenant Governor of Texas, discusses his role in the October surprise. And his account is backed up by enough circumstantial evidence for the Times to run with the story. The Times notes, Mr. Barnes is no shady foreign arms dealer with questionable credibility like some of the characters who fueled previous iterations of the October surprise theory. If the New York Times says it, it's got to be true, right? And anyway, I'm glad that finally we have a major media in the United States talking about the October surprise and its reality. So this is Intelligence Assets, a love story. CIA asset and feminist icon, Gloria Steinem and Pottinger had a nine-year relationship in the 1970s and 1980s. Steinem was the director of the CIA-funded Independent Research Service, which recruited American students to disrupt Soviet-controlled World Youth Festivals in Vienna in 1959 and Helsinki in 1962. And this is a quote from that icon of feminism, Gloria Steinem. In my experience, the agency was completely different from its image. It was liberal, nonviolent, and honorable. Apparently, she wasn't subjected to Operation Chaos, Mind Control, or the overthrow of a number of third world countries. Steinem maintains that she stopped receiving CIA funds in 1962, but a January 1st, 1977 article from the feminist magazine Meeting Ground provides evidence that Steinem was a CIA asset through most of the 1960s. And now we come to Stanley Pottinger. He's retired. He's retired from a life of lies. And he's going to become a novelist. After Pottinger left the Department of Justice, he incarnated into an investment banker. And he decided to retire from Wall Street in the mid-1990s and become a novelist. Ballantine Books paid Pottinger $500,000 for his first novel, The Fourth Procedure, a medical thriller. Now, this is kind of interesting because today, the biggest advance you will probably get from a publisher is $50,000. But we're talking 1996, and Pottinger is a first-time novelist and Ballantine Books gives him $500,000. Pretty amazing. He must be a very talented writer. In fact, if I gave Ballantine Books $500,000, I doubt that they would publish a book of mine. Pottinger wrote four novels, and this is what he said. I'm content now. The writing life is the best life there is. I will agree with him on that. So Stan Pottinger was conscripted by David Boyes to help with the litigation against Jeffrey Epstein and Jeffrey Epstein's estate. And these are excerpts from Brad Edwards' book, Relentless Pursuit. Brad was also one of the attorneys that was launching civil litigations at Jeffrey Epstein's and Jeffrey Epstein's estate. This is a quote from Brad's book. The powerful person, Pottinger, who was closely associated with David Boies, one of the most powerful attorneys in America, had called me at midnight at my home. I suspected under the pretense of representing someone whom I no longer had a case. And now, seemingly out of the blue, he's asked a question, the answer to which was Virginia Roberts. Hardly anyone knew that she was in the United States, and they certainly didn't know that I was talking to her. Later in the book, Brad Edwards says, realizing that Maria Farmer was the witness I thought she was, I called the team at Boys Schiller Flexner from my hotel room near Paducah 
and told them that someone needed to come out and meet Maria to get a firsthand appreciation of her importance. David Boyes called me back and told me Stan Pottinger was getting on a plane and would be there that night. So Stan, ever the man of action, he's on a plane that night as soon as Brad Edwards discovers witness Maria Farmer. In Relentless Pursuit, Edwards discusses his suspicions that Pottinger is a CIA agent. So now we have David Black Cube Boys teaming up with Ethical Eunuch and the Forrest Gump of cover-ups, Stan Pottinger. And Stan really did display that he was an ethical eunuch. He had an affair with an alleged Epstein victim who's extremely damaged. And another victim filed a grievance against David Boyes. This is an excerpt from an August 6, 2022 Law 360 article. And it's quoting and talking about Sarah Ransom, who was treated viciously. I, she's published a book, and she was treated viciously by Epstein and Maxwell. And she had an unbelievably difficult childhood that had sexual abuse in it. This is a woman that needs to be pampered. She has really had a horrific time. And here's an excerpt from Law 360. Ransom also alleges she was asked to put her name to an op-ed written by another attorney who works closely with boys, John Stanley Pottinger, titled, How David Boys Saved Me. So Stan Pottinger wrote an op-ed called How David Boys Saved Me, and they wanted Sarah Ransom to put her name on it. And if David is out there, David Boys. I just want to tell you that if you give me $100,000, I will write an op-ed for the New York Times called How David Boyce Saved Me. So getting back to the uh, an excerpt from the Law 360 article, Ransom agreed to say she had written the piece, but she said she felt as though she couldn't say no, according to the grievance. Pottinger did not respond to a request for confirmation or comment. So Stan's keeping his head down low on this one. And there it is, How David Boys Saved Me from the New York Times, November 15th, 2017. Here is an excerpt that Sarah supposedly wrote that was written by Stan Ponger. Having read the article by Professor Deborah L. Rode criticizing the lawyer David Boys, I doubt that she has any firsthand experience with how Mr. Boys deals with rape and abuse victims. And then Stan Pottinger goes on to say, or should we say Sarah goes on to say, when I was in the depths of despair from having been trafficked by very powerful people, wealthy people, I was unable to find anyone who would take my abuse seriously. Mr. Boyce heard me and came to my rescue. That's pretty quaint that David Black Cube Boys is coming to her rescue. Sarah had a very difficult time. When she was represented by Boys Schiller Flexner, she attempted suicide in uh, 2018. She was pressured to accept her settlement with the Epstein Victims Compensation Fund as she was recovering from her suicide attempt. And this is from the ethical eunuch Stan Pottinger, the excerpt from uh, the Law 360 article. We are just on the verge of racking up larger costs as the case comes closer to trial, and there will be more depositions, more travel, the retention of expert witnesses, and the like. But right now, neither side has accumulated big costs, which suggests this is a time to settle. A settlement is a possibility. When Sir Ransom was being pressured to settle that she was in a psychiatric hospital, that makes Stan Pottinger's and David Boyce's conduct so much more egregious. The Epstein Victims Compensation Fund has been a superlative tool to silence victims and protect perps. By signing the contract of the fund, victims give up their right to litigate against other perpetrators that have abused them. Here's an excerpt. The claimant must dismiss with prejudice any existing lawsuits, legal actions, or claims filed against the estate or related entities and or individuals. 
225 victims came forward and widely disparate settlements were made to 150 of the women. So the fund did not compensate 75 women and some of the claimants were given seven figure settlements and some of the victims were given lower six figure settlements and eight women declined settlements. Uh, January 16th, 220 article from The Age, an Australian newspaper reported that Epstein victims were as young as 11 or 12 years old. Two esteemed therapists whose clients were under the age of 10 when they were allegedly molested by Epstein at all have attempted to help their clients receive compensation from the fund, but both clients were rejected. The government and the media cover story is that the victims of the Epstein network were no younger than 14 years old. And the therapists feel that their clients were rejected because they were under 10 and didn't conform to the cover story. And although Epstein liked pubescent girls, he was a psychopath. The same thing happened in the Franklin scandal. If you wanted a 10-year-old, Lawrence King would provide you with a 10-year-old. And I'm sure if you wanted a 10-year-old, Jeffrey Epstein would provide you with a 10-year-old. It wasn't like he had to feel the pangs of conscience. So the cleanup. Given the constellation of attorneys who have litigated on behalf of sexual abuse victims, it makes absolutely no sense that David Boyce would team up with retired cover-up artist and ethical eunuch Stan Pottinger if he were acting in good faith. Pottinger having an affair with one of the very damaged victims and pressuring another to lie about authorship of an article and accept a settlement when she's seriously impaired exhibits mind-boggling malevolence. The Epstein Network was an intelligence op, and it makes sense that an intelligence op would be deployed to cover up an intelligence op especially one as evil as child trafficking. The Epstein Victims Compensation Fund has accomplished a dirty deed that couldn't be accomplished by the government, preventing Epstein victims from suing their perps other than Epstein in civil litigation. The fund's unwillingness to compensate victims under 10 years old is extremely egregious and malevolent. The next sordid character to enter this tale is Andre Damian Williams, Jr. Williams was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York in December of 2018. According to the New York Times, Williams isn't your average U.S. Attorney. The U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York is a position whose occupants have included future judges, senators, cabinet members, and a New York City mayor. The U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York is considered the most powerful position in federal law enforcement in Manhattan. Williams and the Epstein cover-up. Williams was slated to oversee the Epstein trial, but Epstein was preoccupied with his death. The Maxwell trial was an absolute sham. Maxwell and Epstein trafficked children together for approximately three decades. And she was merely indicted on one count of child trafficking, which carries a 15-year-to-life sentence. The federal prosecutors were aware of over 30 child trafficking victims, but they only called four victims as witnesses. And those victims had been exclusively molested by Epstein and Maxwell. The federal prosecutors were aware of various Epstein procurers, who we can call pimps, and numerous perpetrators. However, the prosecutor's flagrant objective was a cover-up of the Epstein procurers and perpetrators. The cover-up is consummated. Maxwell is found guilty on one count of child trafficking and sentenced to 20 years. None of the procurers are indicted, and none of the perpetrators are indicted. U.S. Attorney Williams on the verdict U.S. Attorney Williams said today's sentence holds Ghislaine Maxwell accountable for perpetrating heinous crimes against children. This sentence sends a strong message that no one is above the law and it is never too late for justice. We again express our gratitude to Epstein and Maxwell's victims for their courage in coming forward and testifying at the trial and in sharing their stories as part of today's sentencing.
heinous crimes against children. William's statements in the wake of Maxwell's trial are very ironic because he just facilitated the cover-up of the largest child trafficking network ever acknowledged by law enforcement. The cover-up of a crime is aiding and abetting that crime. So the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, who was considered to be the most powerful federal law enforcement official in Manhattan, is guilty of aiding and abetting child trafficking. The possible reasons for Williams aiding and abetting child trafficking. Williams is willing to facilitate such heinous crimes because he cherishes his power and doesn't want to lose it. Williams himself is compromised or Williams and or his family have been threatened. Let's take a look at Williams' background. His parents emigrated to the U.S. from Jamaica. William's father became a medical doctor and his mother a nurse. He attended the prestigious Woodward Academy for high school. In 2002, Williams received a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Harvard University. Andre Williams Politico. Williams worked for John Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign. He was then a body man for the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Terry McAuliffe. In politics, a body man is a ubiquitous personal aide or assistant. Terry McAuliffe, welcome to the money machine. Quoting the New York Times, Mr. McAuliffe is a walking symbol of the wretched excess of the Clinton years. He raised millions in special interest money for President Clinton's campaign. McAuliffe also founded a company, Green Tech Automotive, which the Virginia Economic Development Partnership concluded was nothing more than a visa for sales scheme. Mr. McAuliffe resigned from the company. The FBI scrutinized a $120,000 donation made to McAuliffe's Virginia gubernatorial campaign by Chinese national Wang when lying. McAuliffe initially denied knowing Wang until a preponderance of evidence linked him to Wang, who also donated $2 million to the Clinton Foundation. With regards to Williams, should we ask ourselves if politics as usual rubbed off on McAuliffe's body man? The Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowships for New Americans. 30 Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowships are awarded every year with a selection rate of 1.2%. Each fellow receives up to $90,000 in funding toward their graduate education. Williams attended Yale Law School on one of those fellowships. Peter Soros is on the board of the Fellowships for New Americans, and he's also circled in Epstein's Black Book twice now, this could be a strange coincidence, or it could be something a little more ominous. Two weeks after the raid on P. Diddy's L.A. and Miami homes, the Washington Post publishes a Puff article on Williams, and it extols his virtues and introduces him to America. The article doesn't mention Ghislaine Maxwell and briefly mentions the P. Diddy raids as a, quote, human trafficking investigation, unquote. Yes, that's right. Williams is in charge of the P. Diddy case. So we know the fix is in, whatever that fix is going to be. The cover-up of the Jeffrey Epstein child trafficking network happened before our very eyes in broad daylight. When a person or entity covers up a crime, they are guilty of aiding and abetting that crime. As Americans, we would never trust a person or a group that is aiding and abetting child trafficking. As Americans, how can we trust a government that aids and abets child trafficking? Although countless ethical Americans are employed by the federal government, it's quite apparent that individuals at the apex of power in the legislative branch and the executive branch, which includes the Justice Department, have aided and abetted child trafficking by Jeffrey Epstein over the course of four presidential administrations, 
too Democratic and too Republican. Most Americans on both the right and the left realize that something has gone awry in this country and our legislators are not acting in our best interests. In fact, the congressional approval rating is at 17%. The media likes to stoke the flames of resentment between the right and the left. Americans have been divided and conquered. However, Everyone on the right and left can agree that children shouldn't be abused with impunity, and powerful elements of our government shouldn't aid and abet child trafficking. As Americans, we can agree on this one issue. Epstein Justice has established a vehicle that will make the government accountable on this issue. And once the government becomes accountable, then the perps and procurers in the Epstein Child Trafficking Network will be held accountable too. I also have a tendency to believe that when we bore into this issue, other government malfeasance will serve us, and we will have a better understanding of why our legislators generally don't act in our best interests. If you want to be part of the solution, please contact us at EpsteinJustice.com. Again, if you want to be part of the solution, please contact us at EpsteinJustice.com.